welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. I don't know about you, but I need to get down on my knees and pray. But I want to talk to you just for a moment. I'm going to share with you today some biblical principles that will absolutely cause your life to be totally and completely blessed by God. In fact, if you don't apply these biblical principles, there's a good chance you'll never get blessed by God. To be a Christian, go to heaven, but you'll never be blessed on this planet. Now, let 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 me explain something that I didn't explain to the last church service, last couple of church services. If I was to share with you some truths that would make you a multimillionaire, hear me, by applying six little things and looking for them in your life, you would be sitting on the edge of your chair taking notes. Not one of you would fall asleep. You would take notes and you would make sure that you get that principle down because you really want to be rich. There's no wealth that's greater than the blessings of the Lord. I'm going to share with you I'm not talking about how to become a multimillionaire. That's foolishness. That's cheap stuff compared to the blessings of the Lord. I'm going to share with you today a principle of the Word of God that if you adhere to it in your life, you will never be the same, number one, and you will be in a place where God can pour out his blessings on you. And you will be blessed. And that ought to be worthy of you sitting forward, taking notes, and listening closely today. Is that okay? I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. I need God. You need God. Come on, stand to your feet. And let's go before the Lord. Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. How good it is to be in the house of the Lord. We're grateful, Father, we haven't come to hear from a man We haven't come to hear from a woman. We haven't come to hear from a tall man, short man. We haven't come to hear from an old man or young man. We haven't come to hear from a black man or white man or brown man. We've come to hear from the teacher of the church who is the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. We thank you, Father, as you're going to bless us this day with your word. We also ask that you bless all the churches across the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the word of God. Bless our Baptist brothers and sisters and Lutherans and Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary Chapels and Harvest Oak Valley and Oasis. And we thank you, God, for the well and the way, and we thank you for Ecclesia and Emmanuel Baptist and Trinity, Lord, and all the great churches that are out there, San Bernardino Temple. Bless them, Father, as you would bless us this day, and we'll give you the praise and glory for your wisdom, for there are diversities in churches, Lord, so that everybody can find the right spot for their thinking, how wise you are. Now in this house, we are grateful, and we give you the praise, give you all the glory, Jesus' mighty name with a great big shout, we all say, Amen. Amen. Go ahead and take your seat. Go with me to Hebrews in the sixth chapter, verse number 12. Last week, Dan was in, Pastor Dan was in verse number 12, talking about being slothful or lazy in any kind of capacity. A great message, and if you didn't hear it, you ought to go get it and listen to it a number of times because we all have a tendency at time to time to find ourselves getting lazy and sloppy about our relationship with the things of God and even the work habits that we have. Before I give you a title of today's message, I want to share with you the verse itself. Hebrews, the sixth chapter, verse number 12 says this, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate, and I underline and highlighted the word imitate for you, those who through faith and patience have inherited the promises. The word imitate is a fascinating word And it means a lot about what God requires or what God's desiring for you. I think a better translation than what we just read 
is the old King James. If you have an old King James Bible, it says it like this, that you not be slothful, but followers. God cares about who you follow. In fact, if you follow the wrong person, you're going to end up in the wrong place, and God can't bless you in that wrong place. Which means no matter how much he loves you, how much he wants to bless you, he can't bless you if you're in the wrong place. And that following is extremely important. From day one with Adam and Eve, they were called by God to follow God. And it's when they started following something else, other that serpent in the garden, other than God, that they found themselves in incredible trouble. That has been going on for years, even with the church. You've got to understand this. In the side of each one of our spiritual DNA, we're made up by God to be followers. Everybody is a follower of somebody. Everybody. I don't care how independent you think you are. You are independent towards something because you saw and followed something. Someone who comes along and says, I don't follow anybody. I'm on my own man. I make my own decisions. Well, you're just a stupid follower of yourself. <laughs> Bottom line. And we all follow. We follow trends and we follow fashions and we follow fads. Billions of dollars are spent every year because we are followers. We follow heroes that are wrong like Superman and Batman and, and uh, Spider-Man and everybody else, man. <laughs> because we're followers. We're looking for somebody to follow and yet the Bible makes it very clear that God wants us to follow somebody that is the right one to follow because if the right one to follow takes you to the right place, in the right place you'll get blessed. In the wrong place you won't get blessed. Because if he blessed you in the wrong place, you'd stay in the wrong place thinking it's the right place. I'll give you an illustration of that. If you ever had children that you said, go clean your room, if you clean your room real good, I'll give you some form of reward. After a little while, you'll go into the room. It's an absolute total mess. They got junk everywhere. I remember one of my kids, I won't tell you which one, but he's sitting on the front row next to mama. <laughs> he collected everything under his bed. I mean, I don't care what it was. If it was a dead rat in the field, it was under his bed at the end of the day. All my tools were under his bed, rocks, dirt balls. Who, I, who has dirt clods underneath a bed? What is that all about? So if I went in and I found that room not clean and I rewarded them anyway, would a child think it's right or wrong? Because they got the reward, would think it's right and never change. And it's the same principle with God. When you follow the wrong person, you end up in the wrong place and God cannot reward you there or bless you because if you do get a reward or a blessing there, you'll just think that's the right place and stay out of sync with God. Are you following me? And I want you to know something. When you follow the wrong person and they're not going anywhere, guess where you go? Nowhere. Very important that you spend a little time following the right people. That God gives us examples in Scripture to follow. That's what this is really all about. Because God cares, knows the human anatomy, knows the heart, the DNA of each one of our makeup, and knows without a shadow of a doubt that we are followers, really, by nature. But who we follow has a lot to do with who we think is important. We follow mega stars and superstars and rock stars, and you'll only end up like them, defeated and destroyed in life at the end of their life, producing nothing. So God makes this very clear, don't be slothful, but followers. And today I want to just share with you how important it is to be a follower. In fact, the title of the message is a word that's not even a real word, but you'll understand it now. It's called fellowship. People call me all the time and say, Pastor Jim, even from all over the world, and say, do you have leadership 
tapes. You know, obviously, your size of your church and what's going on at the Rock Church is touching the world, and we want to know what your leadership principles and outstanding. And I have to tell them, I said, save your money. You know, you can go to conferences, leadership conferences. You can learn how to be a leader and do all that kind of stuff. But I want you to know something. The greatest leader is the one who's the greatest follower. That's what this is all about, because there's only one leader, not you, not me. His name is Jesus. And when we follow him, it all works. When we follow ourselves or men's ideologies and philosophies, it all fails. And today, here we are learning how to be good followers. Because the greatest leaders that are on the planet are the people who followed the greatest leader there was. And his name is Jesus. Is anybody listening? Without it, it just isn't going to work. So I have today six things that I want to quickly go through with you so that you can identify who it is that you should be following and whether or not. These six things will tell you about who to follow. For an example, how many people have you known over the years that have followed someone who sounds good, has all the giftings, but literally deep down inside is tainted in every area, and they not only ended up failing, but you will end up failing also. I don't know, maybe some of you are too young to remember there was a group that went south in South America and drank grape juice, following a fool. If they had just followed these principles, they'd have never followed a fool, because they're as simple as can possibly be. Learning how to be a good follower takes you to the right place, and the right place gets you blessed. And you know it as well as I do. You want that. Paul writes to a young son, spiritual son, by the way, by the name of Timothy. Timothy's going off to pastor at a church called in Ephesus. History tells us, at least some thoughts tell us, as it's been written, that Ephesus is a church of about 175,000 members, big church. And this young man that Paul sends by the name of Timothy, he writes to Timothy and he tells Timothy on how to be an example. The word example is an interesting word. How to be an example, why? So that people will know how to follow you. That's what this Bible is all about. It's all about good and bad examples so that you and I can live our life prosperous and blessed in the things of God. So he tells Timothy some things, and if you'll go with me to 1 Timothy, the fourth chapter, verse number 12. And let's read it for ourselves. 1 Timothy, the fourth chapter, verse number 12. It says, Lo, no, let no one despise your youth. Remember how I taught you just recently that maturity is not the gray hair you have on your head. Maturity is not how long you've been around or how old you are. That is maturity in the natural world, but we're not talking about maturity in natural things. We're talking about maturity in spiritual things. Spiritual maturity is how well you discern the difference between what is God and what isn't God and how well you apply the word of righteousness to it. End of the fifth chapter of Hebrews tells us that. So maturity is not an age. Maturity is the application of the things of God to the situation that's in your life. We find that out by the scripture. In fact, really, we could have children in our children's church that apply the word of God and they become more mature than their own parents because they're applying the word and that's what God looks at as maturity. So here's this young man going to pastor this great church at Ephesus, and he says, don't let any man despise your youth. In other words, it's not your age that counts. It's how well you deal with the word of God. Is anybody here? He says, but be thou, notice the word example. An example is somebody that is out there so others can follow. And now in order for us to follow, we need to look at the example. And he gives six of them. Be an example uh, of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. 
And if I can line up my future following the right people based on these six principles, then I will always be where I need to be. Why? So that God can bless me. Because you know darn well you want it. And so here we find six things to govern our lives by when it comes to following an example in someone. Number one, the word. In word means simply this, being able to make a priority out of my directions based on the word of God. In other words, I'm not going somewhere. I'm not doing something because I think it's good. No, I'm going to do it because he is it. Good. And his word tells me how to do it. The priority of a man's life whom I'm going to follow and use as an example has got to be the word of God. I don't care about man's opinions. I don't care about someone's insight. I don't care about human philosophy. I don't care about your personal experience. I don't care how long you've been around the block. I don't care if the whole block fell on you. I want to know whether or not, if I'm going to follow you, whether or not you have put your trust and get your directions from the eternal word of God, and if the word of God says it, I like what Billy Graham says, then that settles it. But don't come along with your human ideas. Don't come along with your physical thoughts. Don't come along with your ideologies with me. I want to know if you're a person that puts the word of God first and from the word you get direction. Direction like how to take care of your family. Direction on how to love your wife or your husband. Direction on how to raise your children. Direction on how to do business or not do business. I get all the direction. You need to have an example of a person that gets their direction on how they do things from the word of God. Why? Why? Jesus is in prayer to the Father about you. John 17, chapter. In verse 17, he says these words, sanctify them, that means set them apart. By your truth. Stop right there. Truth is an interesting thing. Truth is pure and holy untainted. Truth, one that's mixed with a lie, is no longer truth because it's pure and holy. And he says, set them aside. And you know, the word of God says, the truth shall what? Set you free. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He says, sanctify them, set them aside from the world, By your truth, and then he describes what's truth. Your word. Not my opinion. Huh. Not my feelings. Oh, no. Not my own personal evaluation of gathering data and coming to a conclusion and making a decision on what I feel. No, no. Your truth shall set them free, for your word is truth. So the very first thing, in order for me to follow somebody or something, some form of example, is whether or not the importance is the word of God. Is the word of God there? Watch this. Second thing, I love this. He goes on and he makes this statement to young Timothy. And he says, in conversation. I like the new King James The New King James says, in conduct. Interesting. Not just in word, but what you do. In other words, don't give me lip action without real action. And you know, words are cheap. Show it to me. We have a tendency to say a lot of stuff. We can go on and say all the scripture, but let me see you live the scripture. At least try and he makes a statement. He says, conversation in the, in, the, in the King James, but the old King James says, conduct. What are you acting like? How do you act? Do you say one thing and do something else? Do you act this way or not act this way? It's one of the beauties of this church is that that word 25 back there. That's 25 years in your face about integrity. We have said it. We've done it for 25 years. 
We said we were not going to start a church unless the real church stands up and does what God's word says, not just talk it, but do it and live it. Well, very clear for all of us that our conduct is very important. I love what the word of God says in 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, starting in verse number 21. Verse 21 says, test all things, hold fast to what is good. In other words, check it all out. That's San Bernardino language. <laughs> then he says, verse 22, really wild. It says, abstain from every form of evil. I like what the old King James says. Can I pop that up for you? The old King James says this, abstain from the appearance of evil. He not only tells you to have conduct that's away from things that are contrary to the things of God, but he says, don't even look like you're doing the things of, that are contrary to the ways of God. I mean, that goes far beyond. I remember as a young man in my 30s, Deborah and I were on a date. Somehow we'd gotten rid of the kids. And so we were going to go to the movies and went to a, find a newspaper. In order. And those days you found out what movies were playing. Keep in mind, this is 400 years ago. And uh, so we've, in order to find out what was playing the movies, you went to a newspaper. You didn't pick up your iPhone, punch in Netflix or whatever. You had to go. To, so I went into a liquor store, and as I was walking into this liquor store, I wasn't buying any liquor. I was going to buy a newspaper. Spirit of God spoke to me and said, stop. He says, don't even look like you're going in that store. Because surely when you come out, someone will see you. And they'll misunderstand that you're coming out of that store with a newspaper. They'll think you're coming out with liquor. Now, I wasn't going in there for liquor. You might say, who cares? That's ridiculous. No, notice what the Word of God says. Abstain from the appearance. Get away from the appearance. If it even looks evil, don't act in it. Beyond conduct, you know, I'm okay. No, if you're looking bad, that's not good. Are you following me at all? So I want to follow somebody that is that intense about their conduct. That's pretty intense. Third thing that comes along, and I love this one. Of course, you can't help it. He tells young Timothy, be an example in love. A lot of us don't understand that love is not just kissy face and huggy bear and red roses and smiles. Jesus doesn't treat us that way. If he needs to scold us and needs to discipline us because we're out of sync, he loves us enough to spank us if we need to be spanked. If you had a child that you loved and he ran out in the street, playing in the street, you would love that child to go up to, go up to that child, run out there yelling and screaming, to get out of the street and then spank that child's butt and you know it. So he doesn't ever go in that street again. Why? Because you really love him, that's why. That's what this is all about. Love is an amazing word. Around this place, we've always defined the word love as personal self-sacrifice, the giving of oneself for the betterment of someone else. In other words, I'm giving of what I think, what I want, what I feel, my ideologies, my wants, my ways, what I think's most important, and I put someone else first. It's all about how you take care of somebody else. That's love, personal self-sacrifice. It is the supreme power of the universe because the Bible says it never fails. And when you apply it, it's contrary to the physical uh, power of the earth like hydrogen bombs and, uh, and nuclear weapons and nuclear warheads and tomahawk missiles and all the strategies and things. Uh, it, uh, those all powerful boots on the ground by the tens of thousands. But the greatest power of them all is something as simple as love. It changed the whole world. And it'll change your home, change your family, change your destiny, change everything about you and change the world around you. And I want somebody to tell me about it. 
And I can have all the giftings going on in the world, and that's what we do, is we follow people with spiritual giftings. Oftentimes, those spiritual people that are spiritually gifted are goofballs when it comes to a relationship with God. But we see God moving through their gifts, so we follow them. God never told you to follow a gift. God told you to follow somebody who's in love. And it's important for us to see that. Listen to the word of God. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, verse number one, though I speak with tongues of men and of angels. In other words, if I got my prayer language and I speak in everything, but if I don't have love, I'm nothing but a tingling brass or a tingling cymbal, one, one translation says. Verse two is really fascinating. Verse 2 comes along and says, though I have the gift of prophecy and I have all knowledge. Man, that's pretty cool to have all knowledge. And I have faith to remove the mountains. That'd be pretty good too. But have not love, it doesn't profit me one bit. Man, that guy's pretty talented, pretty gifted. Should we follow him? Not if there's no love. The third verse comes along and says, though I give my goods to Feed the poor. That's pretty cool. I give my body to be burned. That's pretty sacrificial. But if I don't have love, it does me no good. I'm nothing. Because it's all about that, my friends. Love isn't always sweet and kind. Sometimes it's in your face saying it like it is. And most people don't understand this. They want to hire somebody in the pulpit areas of America with a big smile and as sweet as possible can be when in fact the church needs to be told exactly what to do. If you really love the church, you won't let them get away with the stuff they want to by nature want to get away with. And that's love. Is anybody listening to me? Horribly misunderstood oftentimes. So he says in word, he says in conduct, he says in love. And number four, he tells him, in spirit. I mean, how are you going to live your life if you're going to do things by the natural? If you're always going to count on what your flesh says? If you're always going to count on two plus two is four, did you know that two plus two is not four with God? Two plus two is whatever God wants it to be. And it can be anything because God is supernatural. He is not a God of the natural. He's a God of the supernatural. And if you want supernatural results, you're going to have to tap into the Spirit and be led by the Spirit. And I don't want somebody to come along and make carnal decisions. I'm going to follow your carnal decisions. Quite frankly, I don't give a flip about your carnal decisions. I don't care how educated you are, smart you are. I don't care how you put together two plus two, come up with an evaluation and make a decision based on that. It means nothing. What I care about is whether or not you are following the spirit of the living God. Come on, somebody. And that's why the word of the Lord is so important for us to see as we look at this in Galatians, the fifth chapter, verse 16. Verse 16 says, I say then, walk in the spirit. See the word walk? The word walk, circle in your Bible, it means to live out life. That's it. You're going to live out life spiritually with your home, family, children, finances, dream, vision, everything about you. A a person that is an example to follow is somebody who is interested in what the Spirit of God is doing, not interested in what they think physically. Spiritually, you make decisions. Spiritually, you get directions. He says, walk, live out life in the Spirit. didn't say live out life on Sunday in the Spirit. But every day with your business, your home, fight a stream vision, how you deal with people, how you train people, the word of God, everything spiritually orientated. Without it, it just doesn't work. And he says, if you'll do that, you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Wow. Pretty amazing. So here we have some guidelines for example. Number one, word. Number two, in your conduct conversation. Number three is love. Number four is spirit. And I love number five, faith. Don't tell me you're someone to follow if you're not believing God for something. 
supernatural. You can believe God for anything. Why not believe God for something supernatural? After all, is he not a supernatural God? We always look for the natural. Here's a God that holds the planets together. Here's a God who speaks and planets exist. Here's a God that holds the sun in his right axis so we don't get burned up or the moon in his right axis tilt so that the water of our oceans don't flood the land. Here's a God that walks on water, opens blind eyes, raises the dead. You've got to be kidding me. He's a God of the supernatural, and we're only believing him on the natural realm. And an example for me is not somebody who just believes on the natural realm. I need somebody to go beyond the natural to the supernatural. You know why? Because my God is a supernatural God. I believe him for something I can't figure out. Are you following me? Because faith is the substance of things hoped for. Finish it. The evidence of things what? Not seen. Now, I have to tell you, I hate that. My natural man wants to see it, figure it out, calculate it. I want to know where it's coming from, how it's coming, and when it's coming. Then I'll put up, oh, I believe God. Well, I have to believe God. I know then. But I have to believe God when I don't know, but I know God's got to get involved in it, who's a supernatural God, to make it all work. The just shall live by the what? The just shall live by what? I didn't hear you. The just shall live by what? Faith. In other words, the justice, everybody's been washed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're a Christian, you're going to have to live by no other way. Guy called me in a massive church. California, some man behind by millions of dollars. I don't know what to do. And I said, what's new? He said, what? I said, what's new? I said, when you were behind before, you had a little church, and you were behind by a little bit, but it was still a lot of money to you. I said, now you've got this massive church, and I'm talking about tens of thousands of people. And, and, and I said to him, I said, what's different? The just shall live by faith. There's no different then as it is now. It's just bigger numbers. Same God. Come on, people. I love what the word of the Lord says in 2 Corinthians. Five, seven. Pop it up. For we live out life by faith, not by your natural man, natural thinking, natural calculations and evaluations because you came to it by the things of your flesh. But we live out life according to what the Word of God has to say. Is that a powerful verse? Of course it is. My friends, this is the way it is. Do not follow an example who is not in faith for great things in the future. Because if you follow somebody who's not going anywhere, you're not going anywhere. And faith is very important. He comes along. I love this. Last one he tells him. Number six. Purity. Holiness. Holiness. God says, be ye holy. Holy means separate unto God. That means exclusively his. We're in this world, but we're not of this world. I mean, we may brush our teeth and comb our hair. We may get dressed. We're in this world. Get in our cars and fight the traffic and work during the day to make a living. We're in this world, but we're not of this world. No, we've been translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son, the kingdom of light. And my goodness sakes alive, we ought to see ourselves as different than the world. And I want to follow somebody who sees himself as operating in the holiness and oneness of God. Will we make mistakes? Yes. But that's what the blood is all about. We get back to Jesus. Whew. Ephesians, first chapter, verse number three. If you got your Bible, you're going to love this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Let me say it again. 
who has blessed us with every, some spiritual blessings? How many spiritual blessings? He has already blessed us with them, and how come we're not operating in them? Could it be because we're following the wrong example? He's already blessed us with every spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Let me tell you something about you. Before the world was ever formed, <laughs> before Adam and Eve were ever on the planet, <laughs> God saw your face. God knew you'd be here at this moment of time before the world was ever made. Some of you think, well, I wonder if God even knows I'm around. He saw you before the world was made. That's how important you are to him. And he makes this statement. He says, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. You stay in Jesus, you stay holy. That's what this is all about. You're going to follow somebody in your life. Whether you think you're not, something's going to attract you to cause you to do something. And you will follow somebody. The question is, who are you going to follow? Did you know that the unanimous decision of every prisoner that's in prison is that they followed the wrong people? And when you follow the wrong people, you end up in the, doing the wrong things, getting in the wrong place, doing things that will destroy you. Who are you going to follow? How are you going to know who to follow? Six things. One, is that person directed by the word of God? Two, does that person just speak it or does he live it? Conduct. Three, is that person in love the sweet love as well as the tough love? Four. Is that person in the spirit making decisions by what the spirit says and not the natural? Five. Is that person believing God for something he can't see? Faith. Six. Is that person operating in the holiness of separation from the world onto the Lord. Now, my friends, you have a future by following the right people. Be followers of those who through faith, and I love this word coupled with faith, and patience inherit the promises. You see, it's your evaluation. It's your choice. I can't make it for you. I can only tell you. And you can sit there and be as brain dead as you want to be and do nothing and wonder why when you end up in your life, you're not blessed. So many of you just fell asleep on me. And then you wonder why, because you think you're going to get something from God coming to church. You need to go back to the old church you came from because this church is not going to let you fall asleep because we love you too much. If God spoke to you today, come on, give the Lord a great big praise. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Woo! I want to make sure everybody's all right with God before you leave. How horrible will it be if you come to church, hear the word of God, know that God spoke to you today, walk out, die, and go to hell? How horrible would that be? You don't get to go to heaven because you came to church today. That's not how you get to heaven. Did you know most people in American churches today don't even know 
what it's going to take for them to get to heaven, that is a shock. They just think if they go to church and be good, they get to go to heaven. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you get to go to heaven because you're good, and every now and then you go to church. You're not going to make it, and somebody needs to love you enough, respect you, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. Listen to what I'm going to say to you. If you want to go to heaven, I want you to settle down right now, and I want you to listen to what I'm saying. Sit down, and let's talk. Today, I want you to hear this. You can't get to heaven your way, and you can't get to heaven my way. You cannot get to heaven some well-meaning church committee's way. The only way you're going to get to heaven is God's way. And he tells us exactly in the scripture how to get to heaven. He tells us in John the third chapter, you must be born again. You cannot get to heaven because you're good. You cannot get to heaven because you're nice. You cannot get to heaven because your mommy and daddy had you christened or baptized when you were a baby. Put a cross or a St. Christopher around your neck and called yourself a Christian. You cannot get to heaven because you believe that Jesus is a, a wonderful man and that he uh, celebrated Christmas every year of your life and celebrate Easter every year of your life. You're not going to make it. The only way you're going to make it is Jesus' way. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And listen to this. No man goes to the Father except by me. You're not going to get there any other way. And he tells us exactly in John 3rd chapter, you must be born again. Now, here's the problem. Most people that attend American churches don't know what born again means. They only know that born again people are weird because movies in Hollywood have done a good job presenting born again people as idiots and fools and fanatics. But that's not what he's talking about. Here's what born again means from the beginning of the Bible, the end of the Bible. And for some of you in here, you're not there and you need to get there. It means you've given God all of your heart. It means you've given God all of your life. You see, it's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Always has been, always will be. Listen to the words again. All or nothing. I'll prove it to you. Last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation, you've heard of that. Jesus is speaking and he says, I'm coming again and when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Wow, what a blunt, rude, crude statement Jesus just made. But do you know what he really just said? He just said people that call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all and when he comes, he's going to vomit you out of his mouth because you're not a real Christian. Let me define for you what lukewarm is. Lukewarm, little in, little out. Lukewarm, little up, little down. Lukewarm, token prayer, occasional church attendance. Lukewarm, you're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Lukewarm, you know, God's something, but he certainly isn't everything. And he'll never be something until you make him everything. And the only way you can make him everything is by giving him all of your heart and giving him all of your life. Do you know why I emphasize the word give it to him? Because guess what? He's not a thief to rob your heart and life. He's not a manipulator to talk you out of it or talk you into it. He's not going to hit you in the head with a two by four and make you do this. It's your call. It's your choice to give God all of your heart, give God all of your life, and be born again, headed for heaven, and denying your presence in hell. It's your choice. You say, Pastor Jim, well, how do I do that? How do I give him all of my heart? How do I give him all of my life? Let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll pop my Bible just like this with my hand. Bang! When you hear that sound, bang! Your hand goes up. I'll see your hand go up. And when you're raising your hand, you're saying something to me. You're saying, I want to give him all of my heart. I want to give him all of my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, and denying my presence in hell. That's what I want to say when I raise my hand. I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. I'll see your hand go up and you can put it right back down. How simple is that? 
You want to give God all of your heart, give God all of your life. Who should do this? Who should do it if you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your heart, I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your life, get ready to put your hand up, I'm speaking to you. If you're one of those people that are in here and you're not sure, make sure. Maybe you prayed with Billy Graham. Maybe you prayed at a harvest crusade. But did you follow up with all of your heart and all of your life? Or was it just a little magical abracadabra formula that you call a prayer that you repeated from somebody else? That won't get you to heaven. Don't treat God like he's an idiot. He watches your life that follows your heart to whether or not that prayer was real. And today, some of you need to make a recommitment of all of your heart and all of your life, as well as your first-time people that have never given their heart and life to Jesus. Today is your day. I'm going to count to three, pop my Bible, and you get your hand up all over this place. I'll see it, and then you can put your hand right back down. How simple is that? Are you ready? Here it is. One, two, Three, let me see your hands, let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, thank you, back over here. God bless you, anybody else, real quick. What, there's three people in here. There's another one back in the family room. God bless you, there's four. There's another five, six, seven, thank you. Come on, let me see your hands, wave them at me. They're all over this place. Anybody else, I know there's people all over this place need to get right. There's six wise people, there's seven, thank you. God bless you. Anybody else, where are you, eight, nine, and 10? Come on, anybody else? Anybody else? There's nine, eight back there. Thank you. There's nine. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Don't miss this opportunity. Don't miss this opportunity. Anybody else? Well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for nine wise people. Here's what I want you to do. I want all nine of you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible. If you're in the family room and you raise your hand, you can get your children right now. Ushers, get up there and help them, if you will. Ushers, get up and help the family room. And bring them out and let me help you. All nine of you that raise your hand, or anybody that should have raised your hand, I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible. Friend, get your stuff. I want you in a moment, we'll, we'll, we'll all stand and sing a song. But I want you to come, get in the aisle, meet me right here in front. If you're serious about God and you're seriously raised your hand, then today is your day of salvation. Don't miss this opportunity. You do not get saved by raising your hand. Let's come and let us lead you in a prayer to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior. Let's stand and welcome them. Come on, if you raise your hand, get down here. If you didn't and you should have, get down here. Come on, come, come, come. Thank God you guys have come. We're real excited about all of you that have come. Here's, I want to point out to you, his name is Pastor Joel. He's waving at you over here. He's going to do three things. He's going to pray with you, give you some free stuff, only takes a few moments, tell you about a program we have that'll help you get strong in Jesus. People you came with, they'll wait for you. Is that okay? Only takes a few moments. Follow Pastor Joel right over to this side. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me 
on that cross at Calvary, I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.